Hi, I'm Dee Farrell, and this is our third lesson in our study on the book of Ezekiel. Um, we've been talking about Ezekiel. We've been uh, talking about when he was, he was 25 years old, when he was taken a captive, and um, <clears throat> he was 30 when he received his first vision of God's glory. He was um, in that same vision as when he got his call to become the watchman. And um, later on, he got visions of the destruction of Judah and the, the kingdom of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem. And these visions were horrific. They were, uh, um, you know, images of slaughter and images of starvation and just destruction. And um, you can imagine that these weren't very popular visions for the people. They didn't want to hear that their country was going to cease to exist um, and that their beloved temple would be uh, reduced to rubble. They didn't want to hear any of this. And um, so early on when Ezekiel received his call, God had told him that the people were going to bind him with ropes and confine him to his home. Uh, Ezekiel never tells us if that really happened or not, but the bottom line was in the same uh, section, I think it, it may be chapter 3, in the same section, God tells him that he's going to stick his tongue to the roof of his mouth. He's going to make him mute. Only when he has a vision or a, a message from God is he going to be able to speak. And so that made his messages even more miraculous and singular because it was um, such an event. But it didn't make them all any more popular. And <clears throat> Ezekiel had visions also of um, just the idolatry and um, how it had grown and just the increase of it inside the temple with the religious leaders in the country of Judah. He had these visions, and he used a word in Hebrew that meant dung for the word idol and um, idolatry, actually dung pellets. And in this, he's expressing um, the view God had toward it. If a righteous man's prayers rose to God like incense, the Bible says, it's a pleasing aroma then idolatry was as repulsive as dung, as fecal matter. It was a stench to God. And so that's the message there, how repulsive it was for the Lord. Now, <clears throat> that is um, the message from the spiritual side of the story. But Israel and Judah kept they had historians that kept a record also. And so for that, let's take a look. It's Second Chronicles 36. And let's take a look at what um, this is. Um, this would have been in Ezekiel's day. And let's just take, this would be the news perhaps. And we've seen the story behind it because the Bible always gives the why of things. And so we see the why, the reason behind things. But here is like the history lesson. So this is in 36, chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 36, verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet at the Lord's command. Remember, Jeremiah was giving, um, Ezekiel even sent for him, or I'm sorry, uh, Ze Zedekiah even sent for Jeremiah at times and asked him for advice, and he still didn't do it. So um, he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet at the Lord's command. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear allegiance by God. He became obstinate and hardened his heart against returning to the Lord God of Israel. Now, here is the important part. All the leaders of the priests and the people 
multiplied their unfaithful deeds, imitating all the detestable practices of the nations, and they defiled the Lord's temple that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And so here you see a king who won't humble himself. We see the people who and the leaders of the priests multiplying their sins. The whole country is on this downward spiral into idolatry and um, foreign ways. This isn't God's way. This is this is um, earthly ways. This is other nations' ways. Remember, this is not God's um, decree for them to be destroyed. This is by their own hand because they're following other ways of, um, of, of living. And so their culture is basically polluted by all these other ideas. And this is causing the downfall of their kingdom and the downfall of their religion. And it has fouled their temple. This is a condition where God, who said he had written his name on the land, and um, this is a condition where he can't stay. The glory of the God cannot, the glory of God cannot stay where the people don't obey, where the conditions are not right for, for righteousness. So, the glory um, leaves the temple, and Ezekiel sees this vision. Again, these amazing creatures that accompany the, the glory of God. And he sees God's glory rise up out of the temple, where all these detestable things are going on. He sees the glory come up and move over to Mount Zion, where it stays there for, I'm sorry, the Mount of Olives, where it stays there for a while. So the glory came up out of the temple and went over to the Mount of Olives where it stays for a period of time. Now, why would it wait for a period of time? It's just such a picture of God's mercy. He's waiting for the people to repent. If they were to repent, you know that the glory would come right back in and God would come right back in as a loving father to help um, rebuild their culture. <clears throat> that doesn't happen. And um, in fact, the people begin mocking uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah the prophet. They begin mocking Ezekiel. And actually, by coming up with this little saying that they have, it's a little proverb, and they say they're, they're mocking all the prophets and that have warn them about the downfall of their country and warn them about the downfall of their temple and their culture and their the messages of repentance that God has given them. And so that includes Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, and all of, all of them. And um, it, remember, they saw the, um, the destruction of the northern kingdom, and yet they cannot connect behavior. They cannot understand, they can't see the reason why. And their vision is clouded, I think, and um, by all these other things that they have their eyes on. And uh, they're false prophets. They're listening to their false prophets who are predicting peace and, peace and prophesying peace. But let's take a look at this um, little ditty that they came up with, this little proverb. That's in Ezekiel 12, and if you're interested, the glory leaving the temple is in chapter 10, if you'd like to read about that, and let's go, and chapter 12, verse 21. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. What is this proverb you people have about the land of Israel, which goes, the days keep passing by and every vision fails? Therefore, say to them, this is what the Lord God says. 
I will put a stop to this proverb, and will, they will not use it again in Israel. So here's this proverb, and this proverb says, the days keep passing by and every vision fails. Okay, so there are, um, they're I don't know, a few years into their captivity, it's less than 10 years, and nothing that Ezekiel has said or that Jeremiah has said has happened yet. And so they're pretty confident in their false prophets prophesying peace. They're pretty confident in their views that they still have their land. They still have a king sitting on the throne. And they're pretty confident that they're in their politics. Because even though they've made this agreement to um, cooperate with Babylon, they're secretly sending alliances, sending to make an alliance to Egypt to get rid of Babylon. So they're pretty confident in what they, what, what they, their, you know, scheme of things. Their false prophets are saying it's peace, um, their, their, their false religion, their, their idolatry, they're pretty confident in that. They're pretty confident that Egypt is going to bail them out. That's not what God answered. God answered, said, I'm going to put a stop to this proverb and they will not use it again in Israel. But say to them, the days draw near as well as the fulfillment of every vision. For there will no longer be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. But I, the Lord, will speak whatever message I will speak and it will be done. It will no longer be delayed. For in your days, rebellious house, I will speak a message and bring it to pass. So that was God's reply to their proverb, is that he was going to fulfill every vision. <clears throat> so time goes on, time goes on, and by the time chapter 16 is happening, God is saying to Ezekiel, explain Jerusalem's abominations to them. Explain to them why this is going to happen. Again, mercy, right? God is holding out mercy to them. Even though he said, oh, it's just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to fulfill every vision. He's still hoping. Explain it to them, he says. Make sure that they know why this is going to happen. And he, at one point, he says to them, not even Noah. Not even Daniel. And remember, Daniel is in um, Babylon also, and his reputation is known. So not even Noah, not even Daniel, not even Job, none of these righteous men could help you at this point. They could only help themselves. That's how bad this situation has become. And so Ezekiel explains from chapter 16 to chapter 24, he's explaining in graphic detail their sin and their idolatry and what it means to God. Um, he's comparing them to a prostitute. He's comparing them to an abandoned child, uh, uh, an abandoned baby, um, an abandoned female baby, actually. Um, and they had this practice in the Middle East. You know, if you had a baby girl and you had wanted a boy, if you would, or if you had a weak, malformed baby, um, if you were too poor, then you would put your child out and um, it would die because it was exposed to the elements. And he is comparing them to that. This abandoned infant or a prostitute and he's telling them, Ezekiel is, God is telling them through Ezekiel, that I, I've picked you up. I've blessed you. I've, I've protected you. But you've never, never were you grateful. Never did you um, understand my relationship to you. And so Ezekiel explains their idolatry, he explains their, pervers their perversion, he reminds them that they sacrifice their children by fire, in fires to the god Molech. 
And um, he also has another vision of eagles. And this is a picture of their political alliances, what we were talking about. You know, they made a, an, an agreement with the, with the big eagle, so to say, um, Babylon. They agreed to cooperate with, him, with the Babylon and, and um, Nebuchadnezzar. And yet they're secretly making an alliance with another eagle, <laughs> and that's Egypt. And they're hoping to get rid of this eagle over here, which is Babylon. And so they're, you know, trying to play these um, things against each other. They're trying to play this political game. And, um, and in this prophecy, it's not going to work. But tucked in here is a message about a Messiah who's going to come a deliverer who's going to come and establish a kingdom. And of course, that's Jesus. So here we see another instance of God's mercy provided to them, that this, this situation that they have isn't going to be forever. And we'll be talking about that later. But um, so in the middle of all this destruction, mercy in bits, right, that they never respond to. And um, in, by chapter 24, um, Ezekiel gets a message that's uh, very serious. And chapter 24, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month. Son of man, write down today's date, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem. So the day had come. It was there. Um, no time now. Their little proverb is going to turn sour in their mouth. And all these offers of mercy have gone unheeded. And just like Jesus stood in Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. But they wouldn't allow that. And there's God's heart, his heart. He does not, um, he, he does not, he does not, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. You know, his desire was for mercy, but they wouldn't have it. And um, so what does all this speak to us today? Well, a couple of things, a couple of different things. Um, one is that they didn't really think that Ezekiel was, his messages were real and for them in their day. And the same is true for us. A lot of people look at prophecy today and Jesus' second coming or this, this um, war that Ezekiel prophecies in um, chapter 38 and the one, uh, 39, and they say, yeah, that's not going to but, you know, Ezekiel was a real person. He talks about um, there's a couple bullas that have been found even that name um, Jeremiah's scribe, that name uh, two men that were leaders that, Jeremiah, that Ezekiel saw. And um, these, these men, uh, these names of these men were found on bullas in Israel today. And... Um, he says, uh, also, there's the Ezekiel tablets. Um, these were tablets that were, in, um, that were in Ezekiel's tomb. And Ezekiel's tomb is south of Baghdad today. And um, right now, um, they, the tablets are in a, they are in a um, museum in Jerusalem. But someday... Those uh, that war that's written in those tablets, and some of the tab some archaeologists think that these are the original. Um, these are the original tablets. Someday, um, those are going to be current headlines, just like what happened to the people in Ezekiel's day, as his prophecy his prophecies became the headlines in the news. Well, that's going to happen to us at some point, um, whether in years to come or in our day. We are looking at this alliance that Ezekiel 
talks about, we're looking at some of the things, there's earthquakes happening in Israel. And they say, well, they happen every hundred years or so, then they get, get that. Well, the political, the political atmosphere is, is ripe for Ezekiel's war. The earth seems to be preparing for it because there's earthquakes prophesied in, that, in those wars. And so we can say, like the people, it's not true. But um, it did end up being true in Ezekiel's day, and it's going to be true at some point in our day or the future. And um, I just want, here's the names of these men. Jezaniah um, and Pelatiah. And those, that's in um, Ezekiel 11, if you want to look those up. But those men's names are mentioned on a bullet that they found. So they're real. Ezekiel's real. Ezekiel's prophecies came true. Ezekiel's prophecies will come true. And what does that mean for you? It means that you put God's word first in every area of your life. You know, if you have a health situation or a family situation or um, something with your finances, then you go to God's word and say, what does he say about it? What, 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 do I, what does he say about my situation? What does he say about healing? What does he say about family relationships? What does he say about um, finances? And then put his word first. Don't go with what, you know, some, what, um, false teachers would be saying, listening to someone else prophesy or speak a different message. Don't look at what the what the cultures um, hope, what their hopes are for, um, and the educated um, people of the day. Don't put their word above God's. You put God word, God's word first, and then you'll be able, you won't be taken unawares. When you put him first, that's where the strength is. That's where the favor is. That's where the blessing is. And that's also where the mercy is. If you come to God and you come to him and you allow him first place in your life, that's what blessed is. You're under his blessing. You are doing what he says, gathering um, allowing him to gather you to him. And so that's um, just what I wanted to end with. I just encourage you just to put God's word first. Um, if you're interested in some of end time themes, uh, we have a book, Jesus Coming King. And this is just a primer on Revelation. It just goes over some of the basic things that Revelation talks about, um, follows it just as it happens. And so, and just goes over some of the theories that um, scholars interpret the book as being today and some of the um, theories on end time events. It's kind of like a primer. It will prepare you for a further study. And our hope is that it, it, it um, gets you to read the book of Revelation for yourself. And the bottom line is to be ready every day, every hour, every minute, right? and to live your life in a way that is worthy of the Lord. That's the bottom line. And then here is um, a book called Countries in the Bible, um, Who They Are Today. And this just helps you understand um, some of the tensions in the Middle East, some of the countries, identifies the countries of prophecy in the Middle East, and um, talks about um, just... Yeah, the, the, the circumstances and the situations that are better help you understand the tensions and the headlines. And so um, I'll put links to both of these down below. And there's always a link to the website down below if you'd like to visit us. And um, there's some freebies there. And um, subscribe if you'd like to have the updates. And two thumbs up if you like the video. And we'll see you in the next lesson.